Hello, welcome back. So, yeah, hard to believe. Only two tracks left. Then we are done with the first year, so coded edition. Um, one little announcement. I know we have some nerd boat attendees, and as you might know, the bus will also stop here, and the bus will um, depart at 5:30. Just to let you know, Florian will also be here. I know you're all informed already. I just want to mention it again. So, next speaker, Konstantin Hase, coming from Berlin. Have a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Hallo, Hi. Let me be the first to welcome you all in Hamburg. Um, I'm Konstantin. You might know me or might not know me as the maintainer of Sinatra, which I also wrote a book about, or one of the many other open source projects. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna go too much in detail with that. Let's get going with architecting chaos. Um, architecting chaos. This is the one talk that um, has no fancy description. Um, but since there was no program, you wouldn't know either. I'm Konstantin, uh, and this talk is about architecture. Um, this talk is about chaos. And this talk is about people and about history. And this is a non chronological presentation. Um, there is no proper order. So if you want to, feel free to take notes. <laughs> um, it, but you don't have to, really. In the world of talks, the many, many talks that are there, they are technical talks. They're, let's call them touchy-feely talks. This talk is both. Maybe. So, I guess you all know GitHub, especially since we just heard a talk about GitHub. Um, I'm not 100% sure if you know this, but besides doing techno music and stickers, <laughs> they also do code hosting. <laughs> and everyone that uses them for code hosting or that I talk to really, really loves what they're doing puts their code there and everyone can work on it. And, but, so if you, who in here works with code? <laughs> okay, that's like nearly everyone. Um, so there's one really problem, one big problem with code. And there was a theme throughout some of the talks earlier today too, uh, that it's code rarely ever works properly. It just, it's like those machines don't really understand us, don't care about our feelings. Um, so we built a tool called Travis CI. I shamelessly handed out some stickers if you care for it. And that is supposed to help you with finding those errors, tracking down those errors, knowing about those errors as soon as possible. And if you don't know, Travis yet, you might have seen uh, when you're on a project on GitHub that they have those badges in the README quite often. And there's one badge that says build passing or build failing, and then it's red or other fun stuff. And that is Travis if you click on that. Or other places you might have seen that is when you look at a pull request on GitHub, and then it says good to merge or uh, merge with, with caution if there's a failure. And you can click on details and it will also take you to Travis. And where you end up is something that looks like this. It's actually, um, interestingly, it's an Ember application, which is something that we heard about yesterday. And so say, you just go to the Travis main page, you see the latest of your repositories if you're logged in that just ran, in this case it's Robinius, and you see it had a few 
few build a few jobs with different C compilers, and it passed. And yeah, you see other repositories on the side, and you will also get an email if something starts breaking or if something suddenly got fixed. So it's a hosted CI solution, and it's free for open source. And we also have a commercial offering, which a few companies that you might know are using. And uh, if you are interested in that, talk to me later. This is our team of founders in our official Travis uniform. Uh, yes, that's a onesie. <laughs> Travis was created by that guy. You might not fully see his mustache, so I got another picture. <laughs> in 2010, he came up with this idea of, uh, hey, open source libraries, most of them are not using CI. Let's set up one CI system for them all. And you know what? Heroku dinos are free. Let's run our tests on them. <laughs> Turns out that didn't work that well. So don't try this at home. It really does not work well. Uh, so half a year later, or a bit over half a year later, early 2011, this was now becoming reality. And actually, the tests were not running on Heroku. And um, it was a simple Rails app with a rescue background job that was spinning up VirtualBox VMs on dedicated hardware that were then executing the tests. And we have come quite far from that. We, have, we now have, uh, first, we have support for more than 50 programming languages. We actually support any programming language that you can get running on Linux or Mac, which is the two operating systems we support. But we have first-class support for 15 of them, so we know how you usually test with them. We have multiple versions for them installed, for instance, for Ruby or Node.js and so on. And about every database you can imagine and so on. And these numbers are not the newest numbers. They're actually three weeks old. So by now, we have crossed the uh, 75,000 open source projects because we still grow like crazy. And, um, and the cool thing about those, th this is amazing to me. Like, we're probably hitting the 100,000 open source projects using um, Travis CI by the end or even before the end of the year. And that's including really well known open source projects um, like Rails or projects from Mozilla and so on. And as I already mentioned, for the open source part, that's all free. Not only is it free, it's also open source, even though Nick might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> it is open source. And a lot of people out there are quite excited, claiming that, what, that the impact of Travis CI on open source development or software development um, is on par with the impact GitHub had uh, a few years ago on open source um, development. But it doesn't stop with just test testing your code. Recently, we started deploying your code. And this is like the last part where this will seem like a big adver advertisement. Um, uh, we started off with Heroku. We, this week, we launched Engine Yard deploy support. Um, Cloud Foundry deploy support will probably be announced next week or the week after. It already works. <clears throat> but so one thing you might imagine with a project that size is that scalability is not optional. Um, we need an architecture that does scale. And the architecture that you might see from the outside is we have uh, a web interface and an API, a API that you talk to. But under the hood, completely oversimplified, it looks a bit more like this. So we have, for instance, here a really stupid app listener that just listens for events from GitHub and writes them into the queue so that we don't ever, it's so stupid that we don't ever have to take that down so that we never miss any events that we get from GitHub. And then those go through Hub and other things, Gatekeeper that decides whether to build something. And then later on, 
that will trigger a worker that will actually run a VM that will then run the tests and uh, under some circumstances deploy. And that will go back to a lock writer that writes them out th through pusher, which, will, which you will see in the web interface and so on. And there are probably some people in here that have some experience with uh, software architecture. So if you look at this, what do you notice? What's, what, what is the largest pitfall of this architecture? Any takers? There's a really, really big problem with this architecture. N maybe under some circumstances, but the no biggest... Unicorns. What? No unicorns. No unicorns, yes. No, that's also a good... But the, by far the biggest issue... All the integration No, unfortunately, as you probably already know, people. <laughs> the biggest issue with this architecture are people. And people are a lot of things. <laughs> people are people's shoes. If that's one thing you take away from this talk, people are people's shoes. No, but people on the internet. So one of, one of the big issues, not the biggest, but one of the big issues is people on the internet can be utter douche. Especially if you do open source. The diff is really nice on that one. <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm an exception here. For a while, this is no longer true, but for a while, when you did a Google image search for bike shedding, the first picture that was not related to a real bike shed was my avatar. <laughs> One pro a problem that we often see at Travis and that I see at Sinatra and Rec and so on is someone opens an issue or pull request, someone else that just has to say some, like, has two cents on the subject, says something, and then the initial person opening that issue assumes that that other person will be speaking for the project, uh, would be representing it, and um, this can be a big problem. We had big problems with it. And it really opens up the question, who is the project? But with an open structure, where you not just dump the code out, but everyone can contribute. Um, but on the other hand, why you still want to do all that is people build amazing things. Like, holy shit, this is amazing. And the broader the group, the lower the barrier, the greater the chaos. And I think this is good. So what you need to have is an architecture that works well with chaos. You need to embrace chaos instead of fighting it, and then amazing things can happen. Let's talk about something different. Let's talk about history. So like most of you, I grew up in Europe, where the history comes from. <laughs> um, this is me being part of European history. I currently live in a very historic city, Berlin, which, as you're probably all aware, was divided. And I'm going to talk about how architecting chaos has to do with the divided Germany. Um, very historic. Uh, countries have vanished. Um, people have fled. Uh, actually. You probably saw this, but this is really cool. Um, from space, you can still see the division between East Berlin and West Berlin by the color of lights. But I'm not actually from Berlin. I'm from Halle an der Saale, where Handel was born. And so the problem was that after the reunification, there basically was no real telephone network. It was, it was utter crap. So they started um, building it up putting some fiber cables in the ground. Some places it was still copper. But anyways, it was not at the status where you could have fast internet. So I was there growing up in an East German province, wondering, internet, why are you so slow? I was really impressed with some of my classmates having ISDN 64 kilobits um, 
because I didn't, and I needed to get off the internet if my mother was expecting a phone call. So, um, a friend of mine who was living like 500 meters away, a bit more than that, had the luxury of having fast internet because they had a better telephone connection. So what we did is we thought, well, we know tech stuff. Let's put a Wi-Fi antenna on my roof, put a Wi-Fi antenna on your roof, and uh, let's do some internet thing. And we found out that other people are doing this too, and we connect with them over town, like have multiple roofs, have one roof hand out the internet it got from that roof to the next roof. And we also discovered that other people in other cities were doing this too. And you might have heard of this, it's called Freifunk. It's mesh area networks, it looks something like that. Wherever it says H and A, there's internet, and then you hand it on and hand it on and hand it on. And in, in Halle, we actually started with seven nodes when we started calling us Freifunk in 2005. So this is not too, f yes, I'm very young. This is not too far away. Uh, but then in 2007, when I left, we were up to 240 nodes. And a node means an access point on a roof. Uh, you sometimes have one user per node. Sometimes you connect a full house with apartments on one node. And we even connected two villages on opposite sides of the city. But then everyone was slowly getting faster internet. In 2010, it was down to 134 nodes. And I checked the numbers. It's now down to 32 nodes, because basically it's just nerds now, or people that really like the idea of having such an autonomous network because everyone can just get fast internet at home. But one thing that this has in common with Travis, if you look at the architecture, it reminds you of chaos, maybe? Because if you have one node that connects this node D with the internet back here, behind the gateway, then this network is changing all the time. Because nodes go down, nodes go up, the weather changes, a bird is flying through the connection, and suddenly, I don't know, maybe birds are really well, really good antennas or something. Um, the best way changes the way your packages need to take to get to and from the internet. So for me, I think that is chaos. And one of the uh, problems we had is, or most larger Freifunk networks had, is the size of the network. Um, so what, you what we use is uh, optimized link state routing, which basically says, like, give me all the connections you know, and you hand them on, and then every node knows the full network, and then they do a pathfinding algorithm for figuring out where to send uh, packages. But turns out those access points don't have a lot of memory. If they have giant routing tables, then they run out of their 16 megabytes or so of memory, and then they just die. So uh, there was another protocol developed just for um, Freifunk that was embracing chaos. Instead of fighting it, it was called Batman, Better Approach to Mesh Area Networks, where basically just send out hello packages, and then the other nodes remember where they uh, from which direction the Hello World package came first, and that's the direction you have to send your replies. So that is chaos. Let's get back to Travis. Or no, before we talk about Travis, let's talk about browser games, because browser games are really fun. Did I mention this talk is also chaotic? <laughs> so Mozilla did a browser game in HTML5 to demonstrate how cool HTML5 is. It's really cool. It's called Browser Quest. Uh, there's an Octocat in there, and that is, that is me, but that's basically all I know about this game, because I logged in and then that's it. But, so, this game is hosted on OpenShift, 
and they're using Travis CI. We just launched deployment, continuous deployment support for Heroku. We had no idea about OpenShift. And so there was this guy who contributed to um, browser quest called Aaron, Aaron Hill. And before he did that, he uh, was doing Arduino programming. He did a time-lapse stuff, and then he learned Python to contribute to browser quest. And he sat down and decided to implement continuous deployment support for OpenShift. He learned Ruby just for that. And if I would have been him, and would have, I would have gone there and tried to understand our architecture, I would be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Because deployment is actually uh, a lot of different moving parts. First of all, you need the configuration where people can say, I actually want to deploy. Um, <laughs> that will actually write something to the Travis YAML. You can also do that manually. Um, then we have one component that checks that and another component that actually generates a script for it. And then we have uh, component, a component that controls the VM. And then we actually have a tool, DPL, that knows how to deploy to OpenShift. But the way we structure things, we want to keep them simple, and we want to have them modular. So actually, Aaron only had to understand and know about DPL, which is basically a command line tool for different <laughs> providers. So out of nowhere, he sent us a pull request. It was really good. It was excellent Ruby code. Um, we got other pull requests from, from companies, actually, that contributed support for their platform. And it was needed a lot of work afterwards. His pull request just merged in unchanged. And uh, after that, after he learned Ruby for that, and after he started playing with certain parts of the system, he now has sent us more than 30 pull requests all over the place. From DPL, he started understanding Travis Build, which generated a script, and he did a lot of work from there. And he went on to understand our um, VM code and actually fixed our tests and actually started sending us pull requests that did nothing but add tests for certain things. So we started wondering, who is this guy? We talked to him because at first I assumed he would be from Red Hat because he contributed OpenShift support. And he also contributed documentation and blog posts and his blog posts were really a bit strange because they seemed all copy and paste style. It was more like our blog post, and he just replaced uh, Heroku with OpenShift. And um, then he did a pull request for BrowserQuest actually setting up continuous deployment. And everyone at BrowserQuest was, like he linked to the documentation pull request, which included the blog post. And they were all like very well written blog posts. I'm proud of you. And was, what is going on here? So. We talked to him over ISC and asked him, Aaron, thanks for your work. This is really great. Uh, by the way, where do you work? Out of curiosity. And he replied, I do not work. Huh, how come? Yeah, so turns out Aaron is 12 years old. <laughs> or or now, now he's 13, but at the time he was 12 years old. And, or as he called it, almost 13. <laughs> I guess you're never really 12 years old. <laughs> and this to me is amazing. And I think like everyone in the beginning when I ask you, what issues do you see with the architecture? Everyone was like, oh, it's too complex. Too many interfaces. And I actually, I like to tell myself that the way our architecture is actually help this boy somewhere in New Hampshire just say, okay, how do I do this? Because he just, he didn't have to understand this architecture. He didn't break anything anywhere else for us because our interfaces are actually very well defined, very small, and every application can easily be developed on its own. He did not have to know how Travis works. 
you just could develop it locally and see if it deploys to uh, OpenShift. And also, one thing I found is having such a complex architecture, it makes it really easy to change that architecture, to take out one app and put in another app. And it's also, this architecture is very forgiving for really, really crappy code, because it is really, really easy to get rid of that code later on. It's really, really easy to swap things out while they're running. And um, this change allows you to do amazing things, to iterate, to be crazy while doing so. This is my other coworker. And <laughs> that combined with open source makes for really, really powerful basis for still being able to develop actually complex applications. And I hope this made somewhat sense. I would like to finish with a quote that I really like. Some of you might have heard it before from Why the Lucky Stiff. When you don't create things, you become defined by your tastes rather than ability. Your tastes only narrow and exclude people. So create. Thanks.